activities of SAC are precisely monitored and controlled every second of every day. The controllers who man this facility provide the link between the President through the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Air Command, and the link between the SAC Commander and the strongest and most ready military force ever conceived. A moment ago, the duty controller pushed a button and picked up a telephone. And those two simple motions put him in touch with over 70 subordinate SAC command posts. Command posts which supervise over a quarter of a million people. The strength of SAC is its people. Their every effort contributes to the success of the mission. Who they are, where they are, how they feel about their jobs is our story. A story best told by the people who live it every day. Pilot, this is Navigator coming up on EIP in one minute. That was the Navigator telling us we're coming up on our initial point. This is the point in which the bomb run actually begins. The bomb plot is going to be looking for us at this particular point. And we must arrive over this point on the ground so that they can pick us up with their very narrow beam radar. After we pass over the IP, or initial point, the bomb run effectively begins. And everybody in the whole crew, the radar navigator, and the EW, and the pilot, co-pilot, gunner, everybody's concerned at this time with getting the bomb on the target. And when I say put the bomb on the target, I don't mean that it's an actual bomb. It's a simulated bomb. The Air Force or SAC stations these uh, trains. Uh, at uh, about three-month intervals uh, at places around the country. Most of the places are isolated so that the uh, targets would be difficult to find. And SAC sets up all their equipment to, uh, uh, to score the bombers as they come across this bomb plot. The bomb plot knows where we are, and when we release the weapon, they plot us down on the ground with a big plotting board. For my crew, and for most of the crews in, uh, in our wing, while we fly approximately three sorties a month, that's three missions a month that we fly. And on these missions, I'd say we've had maybe uh, oh, five or six bomb runs. And this is not only uh, my crew or the crews in this wing, but the crews in all the wings in uh, 
squadrons in sack. Twenty seconds to go, the uh, radar navigator actuates the tone downstairs with a switch. He turns his tone on, the bomb pot hears it, and they track us. Their final track. On their big plotting board. Now, set him number one, I get him. 25. That's the first run. We have several more. We won't know how well we did until Bomb Flight computes and calls back to us our coded scores. Like everything else of this nature, it requires a great deal of practice. Practice to keep ourselves at peak efficiency in order to carry out SAC's mission of deterrence. That's deterrence not only for a nuclear war, but to keep a limited war from escalating into a nuclear war. Maintaining a nuclear deterrent demands precise and positive control of the force. This applies not only to the delivery of weapons in time of war, but to the readiness of them in time of peace. We live positive control. We have to. Behind that console and those screens up there are over 1,000 combat aircraft and nearly 1,000 ICBMs. Positive control evolves around a system called the two-officer policy. That is to say, at any level of command in regards to positive control, no action towards a strike or execution of force can be, can be taken without uh, concurrent actions by two designated positive control individuals. Now regarding the aircraft, it can be launched under positive control and continue to a point geographic fix short of enemy territory. If prior to reaching that fix they have not received a valid and authentic go code, they will turn around and return home without striking. Receipt of a valid go code by a combat crew in flight must be verified by the aircraft commander and at least one other positive control officer. Even if they should experience radio failure while airborne and en route to this geographic fix, they would return home because they have no possible chance of receiving a valid go code. Now in regard to missiles, this is a missile procedures trainer where crew members can practice almost everything that they can accomplish in an actual capsule operation and get the proper reactions. Now I can take this key, insert it, and turn it, and I wouldn't launch any of the 10 Minute Man missiles that I monitor. It takes another key in the hands of my deputy, uh, turn simultaneously with this one, after we've accomplished several checklists, to uh, get a vote in. Beyond this, it also takes two other crew members in another capsule miles away to accomplish the same procedures in order to launch any missiles. This is an aspect of positive control that is very precise. If we should undergo an all-out attack, it is planned for the missile forces to ride it out underground. Any decision to launch must come from the president. Whatever happens, we'll be ready. Being ready means many things to the crews of the Minuteman. To the combat crews, it means being prepared at the beginning of each duty day to pass a test of procedures with a grade of 100%. For well, this is the only passing grade. And if an individual does not achieve it, he does not go on duty. The single duty day averages 30 hours from portal to portal. And being ready means being psychologically and physiologically fit to spend 24 of these hours 60 feet underground in a capsule enclosed by earth and reinforced by concrete and steel. Through change of command after change of command, the systems are kept in the green, ready to launch in a matter of seconds.
miles from the consoles of the launch control facilities are the silos of the missiles themselves. Almost 1,000 of them deployed in areas isolated and remote. Here, the men trained to send the Minuteman missiles on their way are backed up by those trained to maintain them. And what they do lends true substance to the definition of being ready to go. They're always checking us out one way or the other. They say we're highly skilled technicians. Why shouldn't we prove it? We're now in the process of removing the missile with the transporter erector to send to Vandenberg for test firing. When we do get the word we're going to launch one at Vandenberg, the teams immediately pick up in morale. We've been working on this missile for quite a while. We have no doubt whatsoever that the maintenance has been performed correctly. The missile field is different from the aircraft field because the maintenance people in the aircraft field can see their bird fly every day. Missile people can't. They just go out and work on it. It comes in the green. That's the last they have to do with it until it goes out again. They never see it actually fly until they get a proficiency launch. The basic idea for the missile crew members is to get experience launching, actually launching a missile. And they can't see them when they launch it themselves, but uh, they know it's all actual operation. Uh, we sometimes think as we're sitting out there that uh, the big man on the other side uh, uh, stops and looks and takes inventory of uh, our deterrent circumstances here, and he says to himself, today isn't today. And uh, as long as we can uh, continue having him say this every day, uh, we are continuing this deterrent effort and it is effective. We expect it to be a perfect launch with no holdups, no delays whatsoever. Everyone really gets out. They work hard just to get to go out on these launches because uh, more to it than just uh, working. They get to see what happens. They get to see the final result of what we're all working for. This is the peace of our nation. The order for the proficiency launch into the Air Force Western Test Range comes from the Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Air Command through the senior controller on duty at the command post. And it comes without warning. Notice, launch naval switches. A and the arm, do you agree? I agree, sir. Arm to left, walk. Launch naval switches, arm, warp and select switch. Required position. Launch key. Inserted. Looks good. We'll have a detailed report for evaluation of it later on. Very good, sir. From tests like this, uh, SAC can judge the competence of its people. Ability is something you can't take for granted, even when things are working smoothly. Now, here in the SAC command post, we get into just about everything that goes on. From my position as senior controller, I can see a mounting respect of the command and control system that enables SAC to carry out its daily commitments with swiftness and accuracy. In the event that the SAC underground command post and alternate command posts were destroyed in an all-out conflict, an airborne command post would assume direction of the command's bomber missile force and execution of the command's emergency war orders under authority of the president. We have this airborne command post operating day and night, 365 days a year, along with every other general officer in SAC and on a roster basis, uh, I am serving as the emergency airborne actions officer. Uh, we have a very highly qualified and competent staff aboard here, consisting of operations, materiel, uh, intelligence, and communications people. In fact, it's very much like being downstairs in the underground. Once we're airborne, we establish and maintain contact with the SAC underground, down in the headquarters, alternate SAC command posts, the Air Force command post in Washington, and the Joint War Room in Washington. 
Well, certainly, having this facility at 30,000 feet gives us a further guarantee that we can launch our global force effectively in retaliation to attack. Under a single tanker management concept, SAC, with some 600 KC-135 jet strato tankers, is assigned the entire United States Air Force aerial refueling responsibility. Tankers, strategically positioned, help to maintain the deterrent power of the United States and are prepared at any time to extend the punch of its fighter and bomber forces. Global capability means getting our bombers to the target and back again. That's where air refueling comes in. That's our business. That's what we're here for. Air refueling could be a tricky business. Flying along at 500 knots, transferring up to 1,000 gallons per minute. As you can tell, this could be a bit tricky. But I feel like with our professional crews, our bomber pilots, our tanker crews, boomers, I feel like that we've taken the trick out of air refueling. When we're refueling, when you're flying up there, and of course, you know, once you're refueling, this is all going to coordinate on the ground. You know, you're either refueling B-52 or B-58 or something like this. You know exactly what you're doing, the airspeed you're going to be flying at. And you know this man, when he's pulling back of you, has uh, more than likely been doing this quite a while. And my first thoughts when I look back there and start picking up, you can start seeing him quite a way back from six to eight miles. And you observe him closely coming in, and a few thoughts that run through your mind like this is, uh, well, I wonder if the co-pilot's going to be refueling today. I wonder if the pilots are uh, going to be watching them real carefully. And what you know, you know that they are. Uh, you know this man that, uh, as he comes in there, has been at the game more than likely. He's a B-52 pilot. He's been at the game a long time. And uh, you can watch him. You can, you can tell as he's coming in just exactly what, what type of super pilot he's going to be. If he comes in real slow, cautiously, moving in very slowly, taking his time, you know that he's, he's, he's thinking about the refueling, he's coordinating, he's got it on his mind, and it, as you observe him moving in closely, of course you're all eyeballs when you land back there. And I know for sure that when he's moving in there, he's relying on my skill, and I'm also relying on his skill. We trust each other. We know that, uh, that uh, we're both capable that we wouldn't be there. We, uh, we refuel bombers, of course, uh, in this business, but also in the same the same token we do, I'd say right now at the present time, a greater, uh, more business for fighters. And these people, uh, when they go overseas, of course, you know, with our global capability that we have now, when they want to move a wing, they want to move a bunch of people in a hurry. They can rely on KC-135, the tankers, to carry them across. But as well, our way across there, they realize that, uh, that when we reach past and get to the point of, past the point of no return, that. Uh, that we are, we're sort of a mother. We have a lifeblood for them. We're providing navigation and fuel on the way over. I've had fighter pilots pull up in back of me and, well, we're glad to see you. I didn't think you'd ever get here. They know that that pipe, that big iron pipe coming out there, they know that that means, it, that means getting there. I'm not getting there. And uh, when you get past the point of no return, you're going, I'm coming. It's, uh, it's pretty nice to see all mother hands out there. In regards to the conflict in Southeast Asia, the radiation at the present time. Of course, you know, we're busy with the B-52 and the, the type of fighters at the same time. We feel like we have a, a probably just a vital job, as serious as is, because we see the B-52 pulling in back of us, loaded with bombs and armament, and we know the, the vitality of his mission, the, the very vital function he's performing, and what it means to the people on the ground over there. And the same holds true to the fighters. Uh, we catch them going, coming also. And, uh, and we know that, that uh, we've been right there also providing a, uh, a job as vital, uh, not as dangerous perhaps, I realize, but a job as vital as theirs because they have to have the gas to get there. Back. And we realize that, uh, that when we were finished with these people and they're on the way to the target, that uh, the man on the ground there, this is more than a welcome sight to him. We know the support that the B-52 and the, the fighters are providing there. ground looks up and sees the airplane, that the man in the airplane is also very aware of the support that he's giving to the man on the ground. And this just isn't a, a one-way uh, effort here. This is everything.
everybody combined and hands smashed together to get this job done. The aircraft and crews in SAC are combat ready. But to keep crews at peak efficiency means thousands and thousands of hours of flying time every year. And this means getting the most from the aircraft. The question then, how do you keep complex aircraft from wearing out under continual use? The responsibility is in the hands of those in maintenance. Maintenance schedules are adhered to as closely as any phase of an airborne mission. It begins with a debriefing as soon as an aircraft lands. Each aircrew member reviews the entire mission in detail with the maintenance specialists. All systems that have not worked perfectly have to be fixed immediately. Maintenance control is the heart of the maintenance activity and top airmen regulate its every beat. The system the controllers use is so thorough, so accurate, that they can tell a month in advance where each aircraft by tail number will be and what it will be doing. Because on every SAC base, a portion of its aircraft are on continuous ground alert. As part of the 50% of SAC's total bomber and tanker force, ready to react well within the warning time provided by the ballistic missile early warning system. As a result of the maintenance debriefing of this aircraft, we find we have numerous discrepancies. This aircraft has got to be on the alert pad at 0800 in the morning, and we're going to do it. Keeping the Strategic Air Command's mighty force of aircraft operationally ready isn't exactly an easy way of life. But neither is standing alert waiting for something you don't want to happen to happen. This concludes the briefing. Are there any questions? There's going to be what? We go out to pre-flight this morning. This has been our daily alert briefing. Each day of our seven-day alert tour starts with a similar briefing. It consists of weather information, operational planning factors, and maintenance. During our seven-day alert tour, we live here in this building. We eat, sleep, and flight plan here. We're now going out to pre-flight, followed by mission planning. Alert well, activity, to me, is a, a very important thing. Of course, with our crew, we think it's very important. And we think it's important to the country for defense. And it's difficult to explain alert, because alert, to me, means uh, mission planning, daily pre-flights, daily briefings, and uh, a great deal of study and testing. For example, on the first day, when we come on alert, a good portion of that day, I'll say 75%, is made up of testing. Testing in the areas of uh, launch procedures, tactics, emergency procedures, and on the mission that you're supposed to fly in the event we would have a war. Well, as a navigator on this B-52 crew, usually it'll take at least two hours for every, two hours of flight planning for every hour that you will be in the air. I have to get almost all of my paperwork done before any of the rest of the crew members can start. I will take it from takeoff through aerial refueling into an AV leg or to fly uh, AGM missiles into several racetracks for bomb releases into the gunnery if we have it scheduled for that time. Back here, schedule enough time for some of the pilot work and then land. It's a personal relationship with the other crew members. It's uh, something that I don't think most people appreciate in that you have to not only work with this man on an eight to five basis, such as a civilian would do, but you also have to live with him. You have to live in the same room with him, you have to eat at the same table, and you're never out of sight of that man. And so after a, a week, it's amazing to me that you don't get on each other's nerves. I don't work. We all stay together as a crew, but we do have certain freedoms outside the building. The wife has to be able to accept your job. She has to be able to accept that you're going to be gone for seven days at a time. She can come down to see you. If she remains out at the gate, you can go out and see her in a car. It's just like back in high school days, sitting in a car again. If you're worried over the VX, which our crew doesn't very often, I like to stay pretty close to the airplane. I don't like to get too far away. That involves a traffic problem. If you go to the BX plane, if, the, for example, the co-pilot wants to go to the BX to get some toothpaste or something, we all go along with him. We don't all necessarily buy toothpaste, however. <laughs> we stand there while he does. Well, if the horn blows, this creates
gets a rush to the airplane. And because of security policy, we have to go in a group. And the time requirements are such that you can't have one striker. You have to get there within a very short period of time. And the horn, to me, just scares me to death every time it blows. In fact, when they have the daily test, I jump. Even if I'm looking at my watch and knowing it's going to blow in the next five seconds, I jump. And in fact, at home, if I, uh, I hear something that sounds like a horn, I usually jump. And I turn pale, I'm sure. And I run to the thing like crazy. situation is, these men respond with all the concentration, seriousness, and confidence the occasion demands. Despite the fact that the men of SAC are specialists who work in an extraordinary environment and are trained to an extraordinary degree, they are not supermen. They are just as fallible as any judge, surgeon, or man in government anywhere. In a word, they're human but with more than their share of dedication and responsibility. Beyond this, what more could one ask? 